Hope everyone's enjoying the conference today. We are now proceeding with our panel on antitrust, and today we'll be having um, five leading experts in the field uh, to have a conversation with us. Um, first, I'd like to introduce uh, our moderator, Ted Ulliott. Um, Ted was the general counsel of Facebook from 2008 to 2013. Um, although he spent much of his career in Washington, including at the time at the DC office of Kirkland and Elliott, and also worked in the administration of jo President George W. Bush. He began his career as a law clerk, first for Judge Ludig on the Fourth Circuit, and for Justice Scalia. Currently, Ted co-chairs the Board of Visitors of the Federalist Society, and also serves on the board of the President George W. Bush Presidential Center in Dallas. He has taught law classes here at Stanford, and also at the Scalia Law School. Ted graduated from the University of Chicago Law School, um, but we have since pulled him back here, and he lives in Northern California. Next up, we have Professor Doug Melamed. Professor Melamed practiced law for 43 years before joining the law school here in the 2000 to 2000, 2014 to 2015 academic year. From 2009 until 2014, Professor Melamed was Senior Vice President and General Counsel of Intel Corp Corporation. Professor Melamed also spent some time in the public sector working in the Department of Justice between 1996 and 2001, and notably, this stint included time leading the Antitrust Division. If you've studied or practiced antitrust, you've surely heard of Professor Melamed, and he has received far too many professional awards to list here. But I will note that he earned his law degree from Harvard Law School, and after graduating, clerked for Charles Merrill of the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Welcome, Professor Melamed. Next up, we have Aaron Schur. Aaron Schur is currently Deputy General Counsel and a Vice President at Yelp. Aaron joined Yelp as one of the company's first lawyers and has been part of their astonishing growth. While working at Yelp, he has worked in a variety of areas, including intellectual property, content moderation, human resources, and developed outreach to government legislatures and regulators. In addition, he manages Yelp's privacy and litigation lawyers. Before joining Yelp, Mr. Sher was a highly accomplished IP litigator, spending time at both Arnold Palmer and Bingham McCutcheon. During this time, Mr. Sher represented companies in a range of patent, copyright, and trademark disputes. Mr. Sher attended NYU Law School. Welcome, Mr. Sher. Next up, we have Hal Singer. Um, Hal Singer is an expert in antitrust, consumer protection, and regulation. He has researched, published, and testified on competition-related issues in a wide variety of industries, including media, pharmaceuticals, sports, and finance. He has extensive experience providing expert economic and policy advice to regulatory agencies in the United States and Canada, as well as before congressional committees. Before, he also authored two books on telecommunications policy and broadband. Mr. Stringer currently works as a researcher at Econ One, an economic consulting firm. He's also a senior fellow at the George Washington Institute of Public Policy and an adjunct professor at Georgetown University School of Business. Welcome, Mr. Singer. Thanks. Um, unfortunately, I have to announce that uh, Ms. Srinivasa Dina, the author of the Antitrust Against Facebook, um, will not be joining uh, us today. She had to pull out for a personal family matter. But that leaves us last, but certainly not in least, Professor Sykes. Professor Sykes is a professor here at Stanford Law School. He's a leading expert in the areas of law and economics, uh, international trade, torts, contracts, insurance, antitrust, and international investment. Professor Sykes has been a steadfast member of the academic community, serving as a board member and leading editor for numerous journals. Before rejoining Stanford Law School again in 2015, he was a professor at NYU and at the University of Chicago. Welcome, Professor Sykes. And I'll now hand it over to our moderator. Great, um, thanks so much. Great to be here today, and, and thank you to the Federalist Society and to Stanford for hosting today's conference. Um, to kick off the panel, just some remarks on, uh, the, the title we're given is Antitrust in the Age of the Trillion Dollar Company. And I guess the way I think about this is, these days it's hard to, uh, hard to open the paper, hard to turn on the news, hard to check your Twitter feed without seeing something about big tech and antitrust. It barely a day goes by that there's not some new development on that front. And it's emerged really from an academic sphere into, into a hot topic in popular culture as well. This is a big change, I would submit. Um, uh, as Macon Delrahim, who ran the antitrust division at DOJ under President Trump, um, said in his, as he put it in his farewell remarks, 
when he initially got involved in antitrust earlier in his career, it was more of an, he says, it was more of an esoteric specialty. Uh, but today, he says, and I think this is true, antitrust is at the forefront. Spurred by the social, political, and economic crises of our time, today we are all participants in a spirited public discussion about the goals and limits of antitrust. And in many ways, 2020 was an inflection point in that conversation, says Del Rahim perhaps a signal that we have pivoted from discussion to action. And I think that's true as we look back at this. I'll, I'll say at the outset, this is not a new phenomenon, antitrust and big tech. I think of Doug Melamed here, um, who at the time of the filing of the complaint against Microsoft was principal deputy at the Justice Department, um, and then later on, you know, the head of, the head of antitrust. Uh, that, that's obviously a seminal case where the U.S. government proceeded against the big tech company of its time. Prior to that, of course, we have IBM, we have AT&T. There have been seminal cases along the way. But I would submit that today it's even more so. And one of the big differences I see is that for the past few years, this has really been a bipartisan focus. Um, if you think about it, you think about the most recent cases, uh, um, Apple versus, sorry, United States versus, United States versus Google, Trump Department of Justice brought that case. Uh, FTC versus Facebook, the Trump FTC 3-2 vote to be sure, but the Trump FTC initiated that one. Um, at the same time, both those cases have been, have been continued with, with vigor uh, by, the, by the Biden Justice Department. Um, in the FTC case, you know, choosing to file an amended complaint after the initial complaint was dismissed by Judge Boasberg, and that even involved some controversy with the chair rejecting a recusal request and, and proceeding to give the decisive vote in the 3-2 decision to bring the case. So these are bipartisan actions. Um, these are you know, an antitrust scrutiny of big tech is something, it's the rare issue today that can unite, on the one hand, Elizabeth Warren and people like Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz on the other side. So it's an across the board phenomenon, um, which is, you know, I think part of why we talk about it, why you see it so much, there's a, there's a frustration with big tech and there's a sense that antitrust is the way to deal with this. I think we'll get into that today, whether this is a proper basis for invoking antitrust laws. Um, I would note that even though there's this renewed attention on antitrust and whether the antitrust laws can be brought to bear for reason X or Y against big tech companies, or put it the other way, whether tech companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple have run afoul of antitrust laws, um, there are certain background principles that remain in effect. And, and you know, I, I think about seeing as we're here at, the, at a Federalist Society event uh, and a Stanford event, and this was a, a visiting professor at one point at Stanford, Justice Scalia, uh, writing for the court in Verizon versus Trinco, stated the you know, an axiom of antitrust law, quote, the mere possession of monopoly power and the concomitant charging of monopoly prices is not only not unlawful, it is an important element of the free market system. The opportunity to charge monopoly prices, at least for a short period, is what attracts business acumen in the first place. It induces risk-taking that produces innovation and economic growth. There's Scalia, and I would then also mention tonight's speaker, Peter Thiel, in his book Zero to One, of course, goes even further than this. Um, and I imagine many of you have read this, so this, these are familiar themes. But Peter posits, and maybe he'll say some. Of, he'll get into some of this tonight. Um, he sees a lot of benefits from monopolies. Creative monopolists, I'm sure he's caveating that with creative. Creative monopolists give customers more choices by adding entirely new categories of abundance to the world. Creative monopolies aren't just good for the rest of society; they're powerful engines for making it better. Later, I'll, I'll resist the temptation to read much of this, but um, later, monopolies derive progress because, mo monopolies derive progress because the promise of years or even decades of monopoly profits provides a powerful incentive to innovate. Then monopolies can keep innovating because profits enable them to make long-term plans and to finance the ambitious research projects that firms locked in competition can't dream of. So Scalia with the more traditional lawyers and judges 
uh, pay into the benefits of, or, or to, the, to, to why the law doesn't condemn all monopolies, and Peter going further than that and talking about monopolies as a, as a positive, creative good that, brings, that, that bring benefits to society. So those are just some opening comments. I think those, those are some of the issues that have, some of the issues and thoughts that have helped propel what might otherwise be a, again, academic and, and arcane area into the spotlight these days where it's being talked about not only in courtrooms, not only in law schools, but in leading papers of the day, hearings on Capitol Hill, new legislation, left, new, new bills left and right that are being introduced. Um, so without further ado, we'll dive into these issues today, and we're fortunate to have the all-star lineup that we just heard um, is a, a basic way of proceeding. We'll start with comments by each one of the panelists. Um, I think we'll go Al Sykes, um, and then uh, Aaron maybe next, and then Hal, and then Doug. Uh, we'll go that direction. We'll start with comments from each panelist. Then we'll have a, a generative discussion, interactive discussion, and then we'll open it up for audience Q&A. And, uh, and then we'll proceed from there. Um, I would I, I extend um, be best wishes to to Dina for you know, re you know, that. You know, it's 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 a it's a shame that she's not here with us on the panel. She's a quite outspoken um, outspoken leader of you know hipster antitrust, kind of the new antitrust. And it's, it's, it's a shame that she had a situation come up, but we can maybe try to bring up some of her themes as well. These are also reflected in the FTC's case against Facebook. And as a former Facebook lawyer, I was certainly looking forward to hearing her speak directly to the antitrust case against Facebook. Um, with that, Al, do you want to kick us off? Sure, sure. Well, thank you, Ted. Um, uh, picking up on Ted's very thoughtful uh, introduction, uh, over the course of my academic career, antitrust has gone from a red-hot topic when U.S. versus IBM and U.S. versus AT&T were percolating to completely moribund when the only thing that we saw was the occasional price fixing or market division case to back full circle to uh, the, one of the hottest uh, areas for legal practice, one of the hottest areas for economic research, and one of the most interesting subjects uh, in the legal academy. Uh, and as Ted said, uh, high tech has been at the center of it, and uh, there seems to be a remarkable bipartisan support for wielding antitrust policy instruments against high tech. And what I thought I'd do with my remarks is raise some questions that I have in my mind about the soundness of that bipartisan consensus. Uh, I think that there's some risk that we may be jumping the track here uh, in various ways with the way we're handling antitrust. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll make uh, sort of three basic points in that regard and try to, try to keep it brief in the, in the interest of having a discussion and questions and answers later. Uh, but the first point I want to make is that I believe, uh, as did Aaron Director and Robert Bork and Richard Posner and Frank Easterbrook, uh, that uh, antitrust should be about the promotion of consumer welfare or social welfare. It should be grounded in sound economics, careful, rigorous economic analysis of the welfare effects of various business practices. Uh, Chicago School uh, antitrust is uh, often thought to be a bit outmoded in many ways, and certainly the economics has made a great deal of progress since Robert Bork wrote The Antitrust Paradox. And many of the things he said about certain types of business practices were surely uh, over simple. But I think he had the objective function right. It should be about the promotion of social welfare, uh, not about protecting competitors who are not happy with the fact that they have to compete with somebody. It should be about the benefits to the economy overall and to consumers in particular. And I'm, I'm becoming concerned that we're drifting away from that. Uh, uh, and I have a couple of points in that regard. Uh, much of the conversation in Washington, D.C. today, it seems to me, uh, is coming from people who are not particularly anchored in uh, rigorous economic analysis, nor fans of it particularly. Uh, but there are, there are folks, including very powerful folks uh, in high positions in government, I'm not going to pick on anybody by name, but very powerful folks in high positions who are uh, of the view that bigness is badness to a certain extent, who are, who are uh, uh, back to the, to the days that uh, we should just be suspicious of big business, period, without regard to a careful economic analysis 
uh, of what big business is doing for us. Uh, some of these folks blame all sorts of ills on industrial concentration and big business, from you know, wage stagnation to uh, income inequality and so forth. And they do so on the basis, in my view, of a very scant uh, evidence, uh, simple-minded correlations uh, at best, uh, and that might be a generous characterization. And I worry that uh, there may be a, a movement afoot uh, that will lead to enforcement actions that are based in this hostility toward bigness, uh, fueled by the politics of Washington today, which as you uh, have already heard from Ted, is a politics of bipartisan hostility toward big tech for a variety of reasons, most of which I think have relatively little to do with competition policy. Uh, and so that's my, sort of my second point. Uh, my second point is that antitrust should address what we call in the antitrust world, antitrust injuries. Uh, it should confine itself to the issues that competition policy was intended to address. Uh, not, that's not to say there aren't other issues associated with large companies, with high tech companies, with big business, uh, but economists have a principle that we sometimes call the targeting principle, which says use a policy instrument to address issues that is carefully tailored to that specific issue. Don't use an instrument that is only collaterally affecting the specific problem issue in question. And so let me, let me um, uh, give some more specifics to that uh, relating to what seems to me to be part of the politics in Washington uh, and some of the misdirections that we're seeing there. Uh, I'll start by saying I don't think that censorship is an antitrust issue. Uh, one might believe that the platforms are undeniably, or, or undesirably rather, curtailing the flow of information in certain respects. Uh, certainly conservatives have been very concerned about the, uh, uh, the, the uh, things that have been censored or taken off Twitter or Facebook or what have you. Uh, whether you're concerned about that or not, it seems to me that is not an antitrust issue. That is an issue uh, that we would uh, address if we're going to address it at all through a different type of policy instrument. Uh, thinking back many years, we had the fairness doctrine when we were concerned about uh, the monopoly of information flow on the major television networks. We abandoned it because we thought it was no longer needed given the uh, proliferation of alternative outlets. If you thought that we needed something along those lines today, uh, antitrust is not the solution to getting it. It would be some sort of other regulatory policy. I'm not endorsing that. I'm not taking any position on whether or not we have uh, a, a monopoly over information flow to a degree that would warrant any sort of regulatory intervention. But if you think there is a problem along those lines, it seems to me that antitrust is not the way to go. Similarly, fraud and deceit are not antitrust issues. Uh, you may believe that platforms uh, have undesirably duped their users into agreeing uh, to things that invade their privacy, that exploit their data, that uh, otherwise somehow are not in their best interest. Uh, and if fraud and deceit is there and it is a problem, then by all means, let's address it directly. We've had laws dealing with fraud and deceit that long predate competition policy. Uh, antitrust is not the instrument that uh, addresses that. And more broadly, and I, and I wish Dina were here that we could uh, engage a little bit on this because I know this is a lot of, uh, contained in a lot of the themes that she sounded about Facebook. I don't think that privacy is fundamentally an antitrust issue. Um, if you believe that the marketplace is not capable through contract of solving the problem of allocating uh, the rights to data and privacy, if you think that it's just not going to be a market that works because of information failures or consumer inattentive, inattentiveness or something along those lines, uh, once again, I don't think antitrust is the right way to address those issues. The right way is through um, privacy regulation, and we see that. We have the GDPR, we have the Cal California Consumer Protection Act, we have uh, new legislation in Virginia and Colorado and so forth. These are the ways to address those problems. I don't believe those problems are antitrust problems, and yet I do think that those problems are a significant chunk of what's driving the bipartisan uh, consensus in Washington uh, in, towards, in terms of a hostility towards big tech. Um, third and last point, and then I'll conclude and pass the baton here. Um, I think that if you do antitrust right uh, with rigorous economics uh, and you do it in the industries that are at stake here, which are 
highly technologically progressive industries where the technology changes very, very rapidly. Uh, and they are also two-sided two markets, we used to call them platform industries is the more popular term today, where you have uh, uh, like the users of Facebook and the advertisers of Facebook, and Facebook is serving both groups simultaneously. Um, antitrust economics for those industries is really hard. Uh, it's really hard. Um, the technological progressivity point means that a lot of times the theories of anti-competitive behavior rest on forecasts of how technology is going to evolve in some sort of counterfactual world without intervention. Um, will this little tiny company become a big competitor of this giant company if only we thwarted the initial acquisition at the early stage? Well, that's often total speculation. Uh, and certainly very difficult to get the forecast right. Um, and you see it historically in other cases involving technologically dynamic industries. With all respect to my good friend and colleague, uh, Doug Melamed, I think a lot of what the government put forward in US versus Microsoft, which related to the way that browser-related software was going to evolve in such a way as to threaten the Windows operating system, uh, quote unquote, monopoly. Uh, I think that uh, there was something to that, but a lot of the particulars there didn't, didn't pan out, not because the people who were behind those theories weren't extremely smart, diligent, careful people, but nobody has a crystal ball. Uh, and it's very difficult to get this stuff right. And then when you turn to the platform industries, uh, you have another type of problem, which is you have one side of the market, if you will, complaining about some business practice uh, and wanting to do something about it, but it's often the case that the other side of the market is politically silent, is not involved, uh, and the, the, from a social point of view, if antitrust is done right, it seems to me that what we should do is look at the net effect on the country of the business practice in question, not the net effect on one side or the other. So I'll give you an example from my personal experience. I was a court-appointed expert in the Visa MasterCard antitrust litigation, uh, where a Judge Gleason in the Eastern District of New York had to decide whether to approve a class action settlement. And the, uh, uh, one of the issues, of course, is is the plaintiff's class attorney selling out the class by just pocketing a bunch of money and running for cover. Uh, and so you couldn't uh, assess the merits of approving the settlement without confronting the merits of the case. What could, what could the plaintiffs reasonably hope to get if they went to trial? So I sat uh, as a court-appointed expert reviewing reams of documents on both sides from all kinds of economic experts, including Nobel laureates on both sides. Uh, and it was really, really hard to come to any sort of confident conclusion about the net impact of these business practices uh, on, on the, the, uh, the welfare of the affected parties. The issues here were the swipe fees charged by credit card companies, uh, the all cards rules that require every merchant that takes MasterCard to take every MasterCard, couldn't pick and choose based on the swipe fee or something like that. And uh, you know, the merchants didn't like this, it cost them money. Uh, but of course, that money was what puts, you know, gives you double miles on every purchase. What's in your wallet? Uh, gives you your 2% cash back, gives you your free hotel stays, your free uh, airline trips, et cetera. And so you need to take account of both sides. And to do it accurately uh, was very, very difficult. Even the theory was hard, let alone the empirics of adding it up and deciding whether these business practices were socially constructive or not. And so what that leaves me with is a great deal of concern that if we march forward in these very difficult cases, we'll screw them up. Uh, and what does that mean to me as a policy matter? It means that I would hope that um, judges seeing private cases would be pretty careful and not likely to, to, to go with the, uh, a lot of these theories that are out there, wait for the government enforcers to come in, and um, you know, I just hope that the government enforcement agencies will take, uh, take their time and really figure this stuff out before they go forward. And that brings me back to my first opening point, which is um, I'm a little concerned that some of the folks in charge uh, in Washington aren't gonna be inclined to be careful. Al, thanks. Uh, Aaron, can we, maybe sure. you next? And I think one of the interesting perspectives that you'll bring, that Aaron will bring is, is as a, Longtime lawyer at Yelp. Yelp, of course, has been critical 
publicly, openly critical of Google in particular on antitrust theories, and I imagine you'll get into that a little bit, uh, but would love to understand Yelp's perspective on that and the, and the nature of the cases. They strike me as more traditional antitrust theories than some of the big tech theories that we hear about these days. Sure, thank you, Ted, and thank you, everyone, for having me here. Uh, I've been at Yelp for 11 years. Uh, I primarily don't deal with competition, and my day-to-day -day is more about some of the other things we talk, we've talked about at this conference or we'll be talking about privacy issues or uh, speech issues related to user-generated content. Um, but today's competition, so I'll dive into that. Uh, Yelp, and, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself here today, just uh, um, my views don't necessarily reflect that of Yelp, although hey, they might. Um, so Yelp, as you probably know, exists to connect consumers to local businesses. And the way that we do this is by having a wealth of consumer-related information that's largely reviews and photos, which are contributions from the users themselves, um, which are really rich and detailed, as well as other information we might get from businesses. So that could include, or, or local governments even, in the case of health scores, or from local businesses, especially in the last year, um, you know, information related to uh, coronavirus response, whether the business was still open or doing curbside deliveries or allowing outdoor dining. This was all information that we were able to rapidly collect and ingest and present to consumers to help them make their spending decisions. Um, so this you know, information, this consumer information that we host and that we collect and that we provide for users um, is really helpful for creating marketplace efficiency and you know, kind of making it a more efficient market between local businesses. Um, and studies have borne this out. So for instance, there's a study by Michael Luca of Harvard Business School that showed that when uh, restaurants got a one-star increase in their Yelp rating, their revenue increased five to nine percent. And what I thought was interesting about this was that increase in revenue came largely at the expense of chains and was driven by independent restaurants. So with more information out there than would otherwise be known, consumers chose to go more to these independent restaurants and less to the chains, the chains being the benefit of having the benefit of you kind of know what you're going to get. It's going to be the same from restaurant to restaurant. But when consumers have that information available to them to learn more about what they might expect going to an independent restaurant, they were more likely to do that. And it's not just restaurants. Yelp hosts reviews and information about all manner of things. So for instance, there's a study on hospitals that showed that Yelp reviews and the information within Yelp reviews correlated with the surveys, the official surveys that the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid um, send out. And not only that, but the Yelp reviews contained other dimensions that the surveys don't really look at, like how people thought the front desk was or how uh, difficult it was to get, you know, make headway on an operational sense. So um, this is all information that has really helped improve our marketplaces. And the view of this isn't just, it's, it's across a political spectrum. Um, conservatives, liberals, all have sought to protect consumers' ability to speak out about their um, experiences with local businesses or merchants. Um, and we've seen this in a lot of ways. In 2016, Congress passed the Consumer Review Fairness Act. Um, this was a bipartisan law uh, that had full support on, on all sides, which essentially outlaws contractual provisions in many circumstances that seek to restrict or impede someone's ability to write a review. And the FTC has the power to enforce that law. We've also seen it um, in state anti-slap laws. So at the state level, anti-slap laws, a slap lawsuit is a strategic lawsuit against public participation. It's a lawsuit um, that's meritless that someone brings, not because they want to establish ultimate liability against that person, but that they want to shut them up. It's an attempt, it's a method that um, someone can use to essentially end a conversation. And anti-slap laws provide a powerful tool for people targeted by these lawsuits to fight back and the lawsuit early and obtain attorney's fees. And in states like Oklahoma and Texas, which actually have very strong anti-slap laws, they've written into their laws that a matter of public concern that is the subject of the law includes a good or service in the marketplace. Um, courts have also seen this in you know, my own experience litigating cases with Yelp. Judges really latch on to the consumer benefit that the feedback economy can provide. Uh, my favorite is a case that we were not a party in, but Edwards versus uh, District of Columbia, which was a DC circuit case in which the Court of Appeals struck down a registration requirement the District of Columbia had for tour guides. And in striking down this registration regime and testing requirements, uh, the court said, and I'll just read this, 
Uh, further incentivizing a quality consumer experience are the numerous consumer review websites like Yelp and TripAdvisor, which provide consumers a forum to rate the quality of their experiences. We need only peruse such websites to sample the expressed outrage and contempt that would likely befell, befall a less than scrupulous tour guide. Put simply, bad reviews are bad for business. The court went on to quote Adam Smith and conclude, there's a little mystery, therefore, that tour guides possess every incentive to provide quality tours. So everyone agrees that this sort of content is helpful um, in making purchasing decisions, uh, but the feedback economy can also be threatened, and it can be threatened when consumers are diverted from higher quality information to l lower quality information or even misinformation. So some of this can be fraud or false advertising, and these are kinds of things that I have to deal with in the day-to-day, -day. third parties that recognize the value, the dollar value that reviews can bring to a business in an attempt to game the system. But it can also happen through the dominance of you know, a monopolist like Google. So in Yelp's early days, um, Google results for the certain vertical searches, including local searches, uh, which is the, the area that Yelp you know, works in, uh, the results would be very different. If you did a search on Google for, say, a pediatrician in San Francisco or a flight to San Diego or what's the best air purifier, you would get you know, some ads and then you would get the organic search results. And the organic search results were simply Google's recommendation based on its qualitative algorithms of what the best result for your query was. Today, that operates very differently. Um, and, and often in that previous regime, you'd have a vertical site like Yelp, which specializes in local search, and it would appear at the top of the search results because Google's algorithms had determined that the link to whatever the content on Yelp or on TripAdvisor or on Expedia or any number of vertical sites was the highest quality. Today, though, when you perform those searches or these searches in certain verticals, you don't get to the organic results until much farther down the page where it's much less likely to be clicked on by an individual user. What you get is still the ads, but that's not the issue that I'm talking about. You get the Google One Box. And the Google One Box is an area which shows proprietary Google local product. So in Yelp's case, if you search for a plumber in San Francisco, you will get a results which show first the ads and then Google's own essentially local product, um, which is competitive with Yelp, to show the user where to find a plumber in San Francisco. Um, competitors are then pushed further down. And this is harmful because the quality is lower. I mean, we've met, there's, we can get into that, how we measure that in different ways, but essentially Google has taken the prime real estate on the top of the search results and loaded it up with only its own responses and excluded all competitors from that. So this preference of lower content, of lower quality content, actually hurts Google's own search results. Google has been willing to take a hit on the overall quality of its search results and present users with you know, lower quality responses when they're searching for a doctor where they might have seen ZocDoc or a hotel where they might have seen TripAdvisor or the plumber where they might have seen Yelp to show their own results and exclude the competitors in that way. And this was intentional. I mean, we know from the 2015 um, staff report, that, well, the staff report was from 2013. It was leaked in 2015 as part of the FTC's investigation to Google that Google intentionally did this um, because it was concerned about the disruptive threat that vertical sites posed to its future. And so it developed the one box to essentially deprive competitors of the top space. And this is all much worse on mobile, where more searches are happening today because of the smaller screen size, uh, the user would have to scroll even farther. And any study of consumer behavior shows that consumers are much less likely to click on what they see lower down the page than what they see at the top of the page. Um, so Google sacrificed the quality of its own search results and its creation of this real estate for its own local products, which also have these off ramps as you're, you know, if you perform any of these searches, you'll see links to take you to completely separate pages now that you're dealing in a completely Google proprietary environment where they can show you more ads. Um, this shows, to me at least, and that you know, antitrust enforcement really needs to focus on this, you know, lapse in quality and this um, have a real qualitative uh, 
you know, focus rather than just focus on pricing, especially when you're dealing with an industry where to the consumer, the person performing these searches, this is all free, at least in their head. They're not paying a dime for any of this, but the quality of what they're looking at is not what it would be if the dominant platform was not taking steps to you know, maintain its dominance in this area by showing this one box and excluding competitors from that one box in the prime placement. Great, okay, thanks Aaron. Um, Hal, let's go to you next, and economist, expert uh, perspective on all of this. All right, well thanks. Uh, thanks Ted, and, and uh, good afternoon everyone, and uh, thanks to the Federal Society for inviting me to another event. I'm, it's an honor to be here, and I enjoy being the token liberal punching bag at uh, this, these libertarian love fests. Um, today I was intended to, to share the left lane with Dina, unfortunately can't, she can't be here, and that would have also been a great honor given the incredible imprint she's already had uh, in antitrust uh, in such a short amount of time. Now, today's panel is about antitrust and tech platforms, and so I'd, I'd like to just take a moment to talk about the epic Apple decision, which does not sit well with me. And what's so remarkable uh, about that uh, is that Judge Rogers believed that what Apple was doing was anti-competitive under California competition law, um, but that the same conduct did not violate federal antitrust law. Now, despite commanding a 30% forever take rate on app developers, supported in part by a restraint that prevents app developers from communicating um, about lower cost processing alternatives to their own clients, Apple was found to lack monopoly power vis-a-vis -vis app developers under federal antitrust law, and thus incapable of violating antitrust law because monopoly power is a necessary element. And I think that tells you everything you need to know about the state of federal antitrust law today. The conduct was deemed anti-competitive, but the market definition box could not be checked, and so Apple got to walk free. Now, Doug Melamed, Doug Melamed and I fight like cats on Twitter, or at least we did until we both unfollowed each other. <laughs> but, but we agree that American Express decision, which was invoked by Judge Rogers in exonerating Apple, uh, was wrongly decided and shut off an important pathway for plaintiffs to establish uh, market power in so-called vertical cases, or these are cases in which a single dominant firm imposes a restraint on a customer or on an input provider. Uh, in particular, some courts have interpreted Amex to mean that the plaintiffs can no longer establish market power through direct evidence in vertical cases, but instead must prove it indirectly by defining a relevant antitrust market and showing high shares with entry barriers. Now, Amex also placed new evidentiary burdens uh, on plaintiffs. Not only do you have to causally connect the restraint in question with the harm to a merchant or to a worker, uh, which requires um, one hell of a charming economist, but you must also trace the effect of that restraint, as Alan said, uh, on the associated consumer side of the market and rule out the possibility of offsetting consumer benefits, or what I call offsets, and yet another way out for antitrust defendants. Now think about how regressive the Amex offset rule is. Now a two-sided traditional platform can now employ a restraint to say underpay workers or overcharge merchants so long as it splashes a portion of that overcharge in the direction uh, of the consumers. We heard Alan mention the uh, Visa's logo today. Um, so long as it does that, um, the conduct is now shielded from antitrust scrutiny. Now, recall that Amex uh, similarly does not allow merchants to steer their customers to lower cost credit cards, the so-called anti-steering rule. So whenever the one percenters, like Doug or Alan, uh, are enjoying their Michelle Bernstein catered lunches at the American Express Centurion Lounge or getting the free massages, just know that the Supreme Court made those benefits possible off the backs of small merchants who pay inflated fees due to Amex's anti-steering rule. It's a true reverse Robin Hood decision. Now, single firm monopolization cases are decided under a rule of reason uh, framework, and Professor Michael Carrier of Rutgers did a study to look at the win rate of plaintiffs under that standard, and uh, he found that uh, they win on about 3% uh, of occasions, three, uh, three, that's a single digit, 3%. And judging how Amex has been invoked now in Epic, and in US v. Sabre, which was a merger, and in a no-poach labor antitrust case that I can't mention by name, I suspect the win rate uh, for plaintiffs in rule of reason cases might get even closer to zero. 
uh, which Alan might like, but, but I don't. And that would be terrible uh, for economic consultants like myself. <laughs> um, but it would also be terrible uh, for the antitrust um, a, a, a defense bar as well, uh, uh, because uh, they, of course, depend on, on these cases being filed, and the cases are very expensive to file. I mean, who's going to spend millions of dollars, uh, not just on economic experts, but on technical experts as well, uh, for the chance at, uh, at recovering a case for, say, a 2% win rate? And when the cases stop coming, uh, that means no work for, for the defense firms I mentioned, but more pressing for consumers and workers uh, who need antitrust enforcement in the face of these massive power imbalances. Uh, it's very important that we figure out a way to reinvigorate antitrust. Now, what is it about Apple's 30% forever tax uh, on app developers that should offend even a libertarian? All right? I'm confident that if a 30% forever tax were imposed by a state as opposed to a monopolist like Apple, the same value extraction would offend this audience. Now, many independent sellers on Amazon uh, pay take rates or tax rates in excess of 50% when you include uh, the fulfillment fees and the advertising fees. But if separating an entrepreneur from the fruits of her labor offends your sense of fairness, it should offend you regardless of which bully is doing the separating. Now, without getting into whether Apple's gag order against app developers might be anti-competitive. Let me just try out one argument on you as to why I think Apple's 30% forever tax is unfair. Apple is being compensated, at least in part, for its matchmaking role, bringing together users and app developers. Now, no analogy is perfect, but here's one anecdote about contracts, about how contracts are structured uh, to reward matchmakers in a competitive market. Right? I sold my economic shop uh, at the tender age of 37 to a publicly traded consulting firm. Uh, and the details are in Navigant's 10K if you're interested. And don't worry, I'm, I'm not like Peter Thiel rich, but I, I suspect we might stay in the same hotels when we vacation. And the matchmaker who brokered that deal was paid a percentage of the first year's revenues generated by my subsidiary. Now, I never asked why, uh, but I suspect the market has figured out, or at least the competitive market, uh, is that if I'm still with my suitor, say five years after the acquisition, the value created in year five has very little to do with the matchmaker, but instead reflects something special going on between my practice and the larger firm. And yet, Apple wants 30% of the app developer's value creation forever. So that's enough uh, picking on Apple. Uh, as Peter Thiel, I've got some Peter Thiel jokes in here. He was supposed to be here for this panel. As, as he once wrote in the Wall Street Journal, to an economist, every monopoly looks the same. Uh, and I would say, at least to this uh, econ, economist, uh, I, I'm, I'm not racist towards all monopolists. It's the exploitation of the monopoly, not the monopoly itself, that is offensive. I just want to close out really quick with a, with a quick reflection on the new direction of antitrust enforcement under the Biden administration. Uh, you'd think by reading uh, the Wall Street Journal editorial pages or Carl Shapiro's submissions to pro-market, that's a joke that only Doug will get, that we are witnessing some epic duel between capitalism and socialism, uh, with economics tossed aside by Lena Kahn as she leads some kind of illegal takings of the big tech's property rights. Let me just assure you that nothing could be further from the truth. The fight between capitalism and socialism is over, and capitalism won. No one is suggesting that the government take over the means of production in any of these firms, or even take away any firm's monopoly. And economics can support a more interventionist approach. Instead, antitrust enforcement should be understood as erecting guardrails to ensure the proper functioning of capitalism, without which a few firms would leverage their gatekeeping power uh, via illegal restraints to swallow the internet and innovation would grind to a halt. I have some more thoughts here. I'm going to pause there and turn it over to the panel, and hopefully we can get into this more. But thanks for having me again. Great. Thanks, Hal. Doug, um, you've received incoming from both Alan and, and Hal now, so you get the last word for the openers, at least. Uh, I expected by now to have my blood pressure boiling because <laughs> it comes uh, hostile fire from the right and the left. Actually, I, I agree with uh, almost uh, with most of the things that have been said. Um, so let me just summarize my perspective on this. By my count, the tech platforms are associated with 12 serious public policy questions. I'm not saying they've done something wrong. I'm not saying the government ought to fix them. There's some serious questions, and I put them into 12 different categories. There's a lot. 
Uh, but antitrust is not the solution for all but arguably part of one of them. And that's what I really want to say in my opening comments. I want to make five points. One, antitrust law is not about size, power, high prices, or low wages. It's about bad conduct, anti-competitive conduct. Now, that didn't come from the Chicago School, from Robert Bork. It didn't come from the Harvard School. It didn't come from the Consumer Welfare Standard. It's been in this explicitly in the statutes for 130 years. The Sherman Act has two basic prohibitions, uh, uh, conspiracies that restrain trade and monopolizing. The Clay that was 1890. The Clayton Act passed in 1914, the high watermark of Brandeisian progressive era, prohibits mergers uh, that, that reduce comp that restrain competition. Um, so, antitrust law is about bad conduct. Second, conceptually, antitrust law is sound. It's capacious enough to deal with all matters of commercial conduct, and it's focused on economic welfare. It's also conceptually quite simple. All antitrust violations have two basic elements. One, the creation of market power by anti-competitive conduct. That's the second element. Market power is created when the competitive discipline imposed on a firm is reduced, either by agreement with that firm or by exclusion or harm to that firm. Anti-competitive conduct is conduct that tends to weaken the discipline of rivals and does not promote economic welfare by improving product quality, lowering costs, or lowering above cost prices. That's it. That's what every antitrust violation is all about. Antitrust law is focused exclusively on economic welfare. In that respect, I agree with Al. The idea uh, is that in increased market power can be, I don't agree with Justice Scalia, as will be clear in a moment, increased market power can be presumed to reduce economic welfare by reducing output and or increasing prices and in most circumstances, uh, reducing uh, uh, innovation. It is accepted uh, only when it is caused by welfare-enhancing conduct as a reward to an incentive for that kind of conduct. The singular focus on economic welfare is a good thing. If antitrust decisions were expected, as many of the, uh, of the proponents in, in, in the so-called new Brandeisian uh, uh, movement right now would like, to have antitrust also have other objectives, like economic equality, worker welfare, climate uh, change, political equality, decisions would be unavoidably arbitrary and unpredictable because there would be no algorithm to reconcile those competing interests. How do you trade off four units of, of equality against uh, a 10% price increase? And as Paul Graywell uh, pointed out uh, earlier, unpredictable uh, antitrust law is very bad for business and for the economy. It also would me make the law subject to capture because there would be no objective metric to constrain the decision of government officials, enforcers, or judges. And capture, of course, all this benefits the powerful, not the powerless. Three, while antitrust is conceptually simple, application of the principles in individual cases entails substantial uncertainty. And the rules intended to deal with uncertainty have become excessively conservative. In this regard, uh, I agree with Hal. Okay. Antitrust cases all the time, as Al pointed out, deal with unknowable things like who will enter the market, will there be innovation, and unobservable facts like what's the marginal cost. This has led to what one, one commentator has called micro-rules. Rule, some of them are rules for dealing with specific types of conduct. What do we do about predatory pricing, exclusive dealing, refusals to deal? Some have to do with, with um, uh, a proof requirements. Uh, like some of the requirements suggested by the Supreme Court in the American Express case. And some of them have to do with process, like this, the, 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 what do we call the rule of reason. These rules were, have been significantly informed by a conjecture by Frank Easterbrook uh, about 40 years ago that false positives, false convictions, are worse than false negatives. Uh, there's a grain of truth to that, I think. But I think the rules have gone too far by a combination of ideology and inertia. Data show increased concentration. They show the mergers that have been approved by the agencies have been followed by price increases. And there are an abundant number of wrongly decided cases. American Express is just an abomination by you. <clears throat> Don't get me started on that one. Okay, so I think the rules do need to be recalibrated to reset the balance between the risk of false positives and false negatives. Now for the past 100 years, recalibration has been done by the courts through common law-like process through judicial decisions. If we do that, now, we'll be waiting a very long time. 
the, the process is always slow and the courts right now are very conservative. The alternative to the common law process for recalibrating is le legislation, which has its own uh, risks and problems, of course. Okay, number four. U.S. and this is really important and, and really ignored in the conversation, in my view. U.S. antitrust law is a law of general application. It applies to almost all forms of commercial conduct that touch interstate commerce. And it is a law that is decentralized, the, the, the enforcement of which is decentralized. Anybody plausibly injured by a violation of the antitrust laws can bring a suit in any one of hundreds of district courts around the, the country for a decision to be made by a generalist judge who probably hasn't seen an antitrust case in 10 years and hasn't studied economics since he went to a, uh, an Olin uh, lecture in the 1980s. Okay. This means that because it's a decentralized enforcement and, and broad in its sweep, antitrust law is ubiquitous in our, in our economy. Almost all business decisions are made in the shadow of possible antitrust risk. That means that the, the impact, the deterrent and incentive impact of antitrust on business is, is critical. The, the important contribution, good or bad, depending how you look at it, of antitrust law to our society is found not in the occasional litigated case, but in the multitude of bad acts that are deterred by a sound antitrust law and the multitude of good acts that are not deterred by an overbroad or ambiguous antitrust law. So we need clear, administrable, and sound principles. Okay, point five. What does this have to do with the tech platforms? Recalibrating antitrust law and preserving anything like what we think of as antitrust law, not just affixing that label to something very different, is not gonna do very much to address the array of concerns about the tech platforms. Because it's focused on bad conduct, it won't do what Elizabeth Warren wants. It's not gonna break up the platforms. Now, there may be specific mergers that are unwound at the margin, but that's not gonna change the business model of Google or Facebook or Amazon or fundamentally take away its market power. Except in specific instances, even a recalibrated antitrust law is not gonna prevent firms from uh, expanding into adjacent or complementary businesses. It won't do much to reduce entry barriers into the businesses which are protect largely, protected largely by network effects in scale and scope economies. And it certainly won't address non-economic concerns like privacy, disinformation, censorship, addiction, social disintermediation, and the others on my list of 12. So, even as to competition and economic welfare concerns, even if we just focus on them, general antitrust principles optimized for a law of general application and decentralized enforcement might be inadequate for the tech platforms. Let me give you one example. If you believe that the tech platforms are, have a, 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 a kind of indefinite growth trajectory because their, their market power is protected by uh, entry barriers rooted in scale and scope economies and network effects. And then we can't allow, uh, we can't, we can, but it would be very costly to rely entirely on creative destruction and normal economic forces to dissipate their market power over time. That some intervention is needed. You might say, you know, one thing we ought to do is we ought to require data portability and we ought to require interoperability so that, the, so that uh, when Al starts a new, um, uh, a new uh, social network, he can plug in to Facebook the way, app, my, the way my AT&T phone talks to a Verizon phone and take advantage of its network effects. Very difficult technical and economic question. But you can, you can see how the logic would go there as a way of reducing entry barriers. Um, but that would be very hard to get to by a law of, of uh, regulating unilateral refusals to deal. A decision by Facebook to say, no, thank you, well, I really don't want to plug into you. Uh, a law about, about refusals to deal that would make sense as a general law to be used by millions of potential plaintiffs against every business in America, where we want to have a pretty high bar to, to mandatory duties to deal in order to preserve appropriate economic incentives for both the monopoly uh, and uh, the would-be competitor. So maybe what we need are specialized, narrowly targeted new laws for the big platforms. They could be specialized competition laws to address, to address special competition laws, economic welfare competition laws raised by the platforms. Or conceivably, they could deal with a broader set of concerns. For example, 
you could ask a regulator to say, let's talk about interoperability, data portability, and other efforts to, to reduce entry barriers, but let's reconcile that with the competing interest of privacy. I'm not letting everybody who, who creates a new platform plug in to the data uh, of Facebook or Amazon or Google. That's a tough, tough issue to reconcile. Maybe we want a regulator to do that. We certainly don't want a regulator with a broad public interest mandate to become a general do-gooder, but maybe, there, maybe we ought to have a regulator to do that. But the basic point is antitrust is a bit of a red herring here. It's a rhetorical ploy by the critics of the, uh, of, of the platforms to try to take them down with the legitimacy of antitrust law, which has a very different purpose and, if prudently uh, modified, wouldn't be a suitable tool to deal with the tech platforms. Thank you, Doug. Um, now we'll just move to some discussion among the panel and how it looked like you were eager to jump in there. You know, uh, so I I'll start to, with you, Al. Yeah, I Any wanted reactions? to try out an argument on Alan and see if I could turn him around on this Visa MasterCard thing, which I know you know much more about than I do, but I follow the American Express thing closely, and I, I read a recent interview by Michael Katz, who was the government's expert in the case. And you, you said that, that the test for whether or not it's uh, welfare enhancing on the consumer side is, is whether the platform kind of uses the restraint to somehow give back or give benefits to the other side. I'm paraphrasing, but I want to suggest respectfully that, that, that that's not the test. That the, the, the test of the, to trace the impact of the restraint is to ask yourself, what would happen in a counterfactual world or but-for world in the absence of the anti-steering rule? And this is an original argument. I'm just, now I'm just kind of paraphrasing Michael Cass, but he basically said, if, if the merchants were able to steer to a lower cost card in the but-for world, right, in the absence of the no steering rule, how would they do that? They would do that by offering lower prices to consumers, to cardholders, in order to, to induce them to take the lower cost platform. And, and to that extent, prices would actually fall for consumers. And so to the extent that consumers have a downward sloping demand curve for these products, we would see an output expansion. Now, the Supreme Court got all turned around in the American Express court case, and they said, transactions on the American Express platform have been increasing, ergo there's no output effect. But of course, that, that's not, the, again, the relevant question. I'll just come back to this thing. Counterfactuals are hard. They're very hard for normal people to think about. I, I'm not normal because um, I have an economics degree, but, but the, what, what you have to think about is what would output have looked like in a but-for world where Amex was not imposing this anti-steering restraint? So I don't want to let Alan off on this notion that so long as Amex or Visa or MasterCard just splashes some of the overcharge on merchants in the direction of the cardholders, that, that ends the welfare analysis uh, for consumers. You need to ask the question, what would happen in a but-for world in the absence of the restraint? I submit consumers would enjoy uh, lower prices for the final products. So um, this uh, anti-steering rules were kind of a little bit in the rearview mirror in the Visa MasterCard litigation. Um, there were all cards rules and some other issues about whether the swipe fees were the result of a conspiracy among the banks, which constitute MasterCard and Visa and so on. So um, th th it's not wasn't quite the same issues as in the original American Express litigation. But I, I think I basically agree with you that the, I, wh where I disagree with you is it's, it's not sufficient to splash, as you say, splash some benefits toward consumers. There has to be a net welfare gain. Uh, what, I, what the point that I was trying to make and that I did make to Judge Gleason in, the, in, the, uh, in my report to him was that when, in thinking about these uh, various practices that the networks had to try and make sure that their cards were always accepted, any place that had the MasterCard logo took every single MasterCard regardless of the swipe fee or whether it was double miles or cash back or all that sort of stuff, all of those rules um, made the MasterCard more valuable to consumers. They knew where it was going to be taken. They didn't have to worry about being turned down when they turned it in and so forth. So there were, there were a lot of uh, pro-competitive pro aspects to the things that were at issue in the case and that the merchants were challenging. Uh, I, I concur that it was a, the, the question is not were there some benefits splashed in the consumer's direction, but what is the net impact of the practice? And that to me is equivalent to the counterfactual. Would, the world be better or worse without the practices that are being challenged. So I don't think we fundamentally disagree. And I thought that the, the issues were really very, very difficult empirical issues that were, were almost impossible for me. I mean, I'm a, I teach antitrust law, I have a PhD in economics, 
and I found it almost impossible to come to any confident conclusion about the welfare effects of these business practices, which is why I worry a lot about private court, private plaintiff litigation before lay judges along the lines of remarks that Doug made, um, getting, getting these things badly wrong. I actually do agree that the Supreme Court decision in Amer American Express has a lot of problematic aspects to it, requiring the definition of a two-sided market, exactly what that means and how you do it is, uh, you know, that's a confused uh, set, of, set of issues. But uh, the point I was making was really a much narrower point, that these are really hard cases uh, I don't trust private enforcement at all in this context, and I, I hope that government enforcement proceeds with a great deal of economic care, and I'm, I'm worried that the politics in Washington are not going to accommodate that. I'd like to pose one question to anyone who, who wants to jump in on this, um, uh, but as we think about some of, let's isolate the, the cases, not the ones that, Doug, you're talking about that are not cases or theories of going after big tech, using antitrust to address some other issue. But let's talk about the, let's talk about, for example, US versus Google or FTC versus Facebook, which are true antitrust cases. Um, as, as we think about those as observers, as lawyers, as users of these technologies, both Google and Facebook offer free products, and how do you think about, how do you all think about the free product issue there and the, the fact that prices are not being raised, output doesn't seem to be being constrained. Um, Aaron, you talked in your remarks about the, the issue being the quality of products that consumers receive. Where, where is the antitrust injury in the case of free products like many of the products out there that big tech companies Well, I'll, I'll take a, a begin a stab at that. Um, I think there's two um, reasons one would be concerned about antitrust problem violations in a, in a zero uh, price uh, uh, business. You might think of them as static and, and dynamic. The static uh, is that there are lots of dimensions of competition. Uh, they're not captured in price. Uh, I'm, I'm just making up this facts now. One could imagine that if Facebook wanted to, in effect, raise price, uh, it could um, uh, change its privacy policies adverse to the interests of, of consumers who care about privacy. Or it could change, uh, it, it, I don't use Facebook, so I hate that, but it could change its presentation on the page of where it puts ads and, and information that people choose to see as opposed to information that's paid for them to see in a way that users wouldn't like. In, in the economics jargon, what it does is it, it increases the quality adjusted price by lowering, by lowering quality. It's still a zero price product. Um, uh, one way of thinking of it, the way I think of it is, is you think of those mar I think of those markets as barter markets, not free products. I give attention, I give data, they give me something else in there. The dynamic concern is if, if um, and by the way, I just, want, I just want to say, my state, saying that there was a limited upside to antitrust recalibration of the tech here, it doesn't mean that a lawsuit or a claim like the one Yelp has been making against, against Google wouldn't find a home in a sound antitrust law. Conceptually, I think it might, I don't know the facts, but that's not going to change, fundamentally change, I don't think, Google's business model. Anyhow, um, but there is a dynamic concern in that if, if uh, a, a monopoly platform is able to raise entry barriers, uh, by, by engaging in a series of conduct that just makes it more and more difficult for rivals, uh, then what it does is it, it forestalls the kind of uh, process of creative destruction, uh, innovation, uh, and so on in the industry. So I think we really have to be worried about uh, the same kinds of things we would worry about in a, in a widget market sold for a dollar price. Uh, it, mm. it, it, same worries apply, just in a different nomenclature. Aaron, any... any Thoughts on that? It sounds like you'd probably agree with 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 Doug's take. Yeah, I, I agree with much of what he said. And there's you know been studies done on Yelp where, for instance, the Google One Box was showing its own um, proprietary results, but they're not the organic results, which are further down. Were replaced by essentially the third the organic results, so showing the third party links that would otherwise be there, but for the One Box, and they saw a dramatic increase 
in CTR or user click-through rates. So something from like 48% to like 65% click-throughs showing that users were actually more drawn to that content in the study when it was not the Google content showing so you could take from that that the third-party content, whether it was Yelp or whatever other site was responding to that particular query, was of higher quality to the consumers. Um, so I, I do think that it's possible to show uh, that sort of you know, test of quality. And we do see also with Google that it is, I mean, Yelp today, I, I don't know that you could start it, um, given the way that the control over the web by Google is being done with these, these results. I mean, the results, if you wanted to start a new business and focus on web traffic, um, you know, people are not going to see your content in the same way they would 15 years ago, and that's being done because Google is controlling um, the results to show its own and preference its own uh, services at the expense and exclusion of any rival. So it doesn't matter how great your quality is at that point, uh, people just aren't going to see it. Did you want to say anything on this? Um, I'll just weigh in very briefly. So I, I agree with Doug that, that the debasement of quality is equivalent to debasement of price. That, that could certainly happen. Um, I think it's in the platforms, again, I think it's really complicated because, you know, it just if you think of a non-platform situation, we usually think that it's not in a seller's, even a monopolist's interest to debase quality better to give the efficient level of quality and ex extract the surplus by charging a higher price. So you get into the platform market and you say, well, what's really different is it is that Facebook cannot charge more than a zero price, and so that efficiency incentive is, is out the window, or is there something going on on the other side of the market that might generate an efficiency incentive despite the zero price on the consumer side? It just seems like the economics is complicated. Uh, I don't know. You have it, is, it is complicated, and I, I'll, I'll speak to the FTC Facebook case, and there's something Alan was asking, it's a very legitimate question, it's what is the nexus, if any, between privacy and antitrust? Mm -hmm. And what the FTC is arguing in that case, I'm channeling my inner Dina now, yeah. um, because she was the architect of, of that case, or one of the architects of the case, is the idea that if there were more competition, if there was more competition among social media platforms, they might compete on the privacy dimension. What they, what they assert is that Facebook has slowly withdrawn its privacy protections as that has allowed more, even greater exploitation of users' data over time with the, with the growth of its, of its market power in that space. That's, that's one of the theories of the case. I think that that is going to be hard to prove, and, and I also worry about how a judge, because I speak to lots of them, um, is, going to, is going to react to a theory that's a bit novel. We, it is true, as Doug says, that quality uh, harms are cognizable under the antitrust laws, but they typically show up as an and also effect. That is, you, you wouldn't sustain an entire case based on a quality harm. You probably wouldn't sustain an entire case based on an innovation harm as well, but I, I digress. So, you know, there, there, if, if I could script or influence the way that the FTC would approach the case, I probably would say start on the side of the market with prices, because that's the side that the judge is going to understand and recognize, and try to show that, that their power somehow by taking over Instagram and eliminating competition in the social media space has allowed them to achieve a certain lift in power vis-a-vis -vis advertisers as expressed in higher advertising rates and see what you can get from there. Of course, tracing through the effects on the, on the consumer side, whether you have to. And the relevant market there, the, the relevant market would be the market for internet advertising. Right. No, I'd still say, it, but, I'd but still, you'd be I'd, focused I on mean, harm can, to advertisers as opposed to harm to consumers. I don't think it changes again. I, I want to do away, I want to get away from, yeah, yeah. from defining markets as kind of the starting place. But, but I would say that uh, social media would be the market, the two-sided market, where, where you're bringing to platforms, bringing together advertisers and, and, and users. And I know just from an economist estimate that, Economist Magazine, that Facebook controls about 60% of, of U.S. advertising dollars on social media platforms, which, which should be enough to satisfy uh, a monopoly hurdle, but um, I'll leave it at that. Can, can yeah, I, yeah. yeah, I, I just, I just want to, there's a theme here in a way, something that Elle said some time ago and, and, and what um, uh, Hell just said. Um, a lot of judges think and a lot of conversation about antitrust assumes that um, in an antitrust case you have to point to the harm. You have to say, well, the prices went up or quality went down. Um, I, I don't think that is conceptually necessary. 
because you don't have to do that to prove an increase in market power or to prove bad conduct. Um, and, I, and I think it's a, it's, it's a very unfortunate distraction because it leads to the problem that both Al and Hal identify, which is how do you know? How do you know whether this browser would turn into the, 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 the big uh, avenue to competition for the, uh, computer operating systems? How do you know what the prices would have been uh, if there hadn't been a no steering rule or, or if, if uh, Facebook hadn't been able to change its privacy policies? And the answer is you shouldn't have to know that. You should have principles, so you should be able to say, look, they engage in a course of conduct that seems likely to raise entry barriers or to, or, or, or to reduce the discipline of rivals by one mechanism or another. In the, anti, in the Microsoft case, it was a mechanism that, that actually Bill Gates spelled out in his own internal memos, which is kill the guys because they could become a complement to, to the next uh, op, operating system. And then you say, okay, so that creates a risk. We don't know how serious it is right now. Let's see, uh, in order to decide how hard we have to worry about the degree of seriousness, let's look at the benefits created by this particular conduct. On the Microsoft case, the court found, Microsoft wasn't happy about this, court found no benefit at all from the conduct it found to be illegal. Well, if you have a risk of apocalypse, however small it might be, it's a black swan event, but it's a pretty important one, and you have absolutely no benefit on the other side, it seems it's fairly easy for the antitrust court to say that looks like illegal conduct without asking the question of what's the price, what will the price be, or you know, who's harmed, any of that stuff. Another area I'd like to ask, ask you about is mergers and acquisitions. Um, a lot of the focus in, I think both, for example, Elizabeth Warren's proscription, you know, breakup, Facebook, et cetera, and also in, you know, in Josh Hawley's proposed legislation. So if you look at the legislative side, there are various moves such as uh, companies with market cap above X should not be allowed to acquire a competitor unless X, Y, and Z are shown. Um, companies with, with market share above Y should not be able to do the same. I'll put those aside for a second and focus on, um, you know, I think this is very much in the FTC's case against Facebook, but unwinding a deal that has already been cleared years ago, almost a decade ago, by the relevant agency, in that case the FTC, Educate us as as lawyers, as as students, as as laymen, as participants in this. What are the circumstances in which in which a concluded and cleared merger can be unwound years later? And what's the to me that it smacks of um, you know, and this is personal privilege maybe, but it smacks a lot of hindsight bias. Um, you know, at the time, for example, in 2012, when Facebook announced the Instagram deal. Uh, still a private company at that point, because uh, the deal was announced in April of 2012. The deal was the deal closed in September, October, somewhere around there. Facebook by then was a public company later that year, in May. So it was a few months into into its existence as a public company. But if you'll recall, Facebook stock had taken a massive hit. All kinds of questions are being raised about the company. Can it succeed? Did it miss mobile, et cetera? So FTC looked carefully at the deal and decided to let it through. Ten years later, history looks very different. What, what, what does the law say about the ability to unwind a deal that's, that's been through the HSR process and received clearance? I'll turn to my general well, counsel. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, is Ben here? I mean, there's a, a lawyer, I think you saw him earlier. Yeah, here he is. So that's the guy who just litigated a private case on those facts. Okay. Now, he wasn't the government having to answer the question of uh, directly theory of theory. Uh, what's changed now, although yeah. he was representing a private party that had, was, had been okay when the agency reviewed the merger. Anyhow, he just won, got a divestiture after the fact, and they were affirmed by the Fourth Circuit, which was a pretty conservative circuit. I think it was Fourth, pretty conservative circuit. My understanding of the law is this. There's no legal bar to going after a previously consummated merger. Um, uh, obviously, you have the kind of real politique issue. Of how, you got to explain to the judge what you're doing here and why you were sitting on it, uh, what, what's changed, and so forth. Um, um, uh, and sometimes, maybe that's the right thing to do. I would certainly hope that, the, that at least as a matter of discretion, the agencies would do that. Only very rarely, maybe you know, maybe the, the Instagram and, and WhatsApp things 
are sufficiently rare that that's okay, but, but only very rarely, not only because it's unsettling to the parties who have consummated the merger and all others following them about not knowing what's gonna happen, but because it creates perverse incentives. If you are a merging party with a, with a, with a, 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 a threat of a, a subsequent challenge to the merger, you have incentives not to have the acquired company flourish so that it don't, won't look like such a powerful thing that you acquired, or you have an incentive to scramble the eggs inefficiently to make the vestiture much more difficult, and both of those interfere with achieving whatever economic benefits there might have been from the merger. So uh, the law permits it, Judges, I suspect, will be skeptical, and enforcers, hopefully, will be extremely cautious. But that's, that's just me, what you guys think. Ben, you want to add anything to this? No, that's not right. <laughs> 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 a lot of mainstream would explain to go on that uh, murders, and it doesn't actually happen. In my case, I'm going to be an old case. Four years later, they were still using the old land caps from the acquired entity, et cetera, from the acquired entity. So, well, a lot of stuff it would be interesting to see what they did, um, except for the fact that it's so unsettling at the beginning of the past. Okay. Um, I think I'll open it up at this point to audience questions, if there are any. See some people moving in microphones. There's one over here, and there's one over here to my right. Sir. Can you hear me? OK, there we go. Yes. Um, so I have not heard the topic of patents brought up. And patents are a innate form of antitrust insofar as um, incumbents tend to be the ones who get sued for copying upstarts. Um, they don't like the destruction part of Schumpeter's creative destruction and therefore often copy them. And, um, and so it is today, big tech is opposed to um, patent and effective patent enforcement and has been successfully undermining the laws on this. And typically companies, the, most of the big tech companies don't rely on patents for their market power. It comes from other things. So could you guys discuss this issue? And I know Intel has historically also been in the camp of opposed to uh, effective patent enforcement for reasons I can't figure out. But anyway, please discuss. I, I, I don't, I, I just had to respond to the last sentence. Intel, when I was there, things may have gone to hell since I left, I don't know, uh, had, I believe, the second largest patent portfolio in the United States. Uh, it is not against patent enforcement. Uh, it, it has been against, um, uh, some of the more aggressive tactics uh, taken by certain people that hold that, that holds, uh, patents claim to be standard essential patents. Just had to correct that record. I'll, I'll take it perhaps in a different direction, or maybe that you weren't anticipating, but let me just try this one on you, is that there is a, a concern that platforms such as Amazon will uh, appropriate data that they can only get from a, from a merchant or an input provider by virtue of their platform position, and then copy the idea, uh, and then use their platform power to steer searches uh, to their clone in the box. This is called self-preferencing. And there are, there are bills in Congress. There's Cicilline has a bill in the House, and Klobuchar and Grassley introduced a companion wow. bill in the Senate recently. Um, and I think under the recognition, they'll, they'll never say this in the bill, and they probably won't say it in any kind of press around it, that antitrust can't really get at these harms. And uh, the, the harm here that we're all worried about is innovation harm. You know, it's the idea that if enough merchants watch Amazon continue to appropriate ideas, that eventually merchants will start throwing in the towel, and we'd get less innovation in future periods. And that could lead to less choice and potentially higher prices. But there's no way um, an economist is going to be able to establish that uh, in an antitrust court. And I think what this, what these uh, proposed bills would do is basically fill a gap in antitrust protection right now by allowing um, the DOJ, the FTC, and state AGs to bring cases under a new standard, be a non-discrimination standard, uh, to, to prevent this sort of um, appropriation, cloning, and steering that's going on. Okay, sir, over here. Hi, uh, Mike, uh, I'm a journalist. Um, I wanted to just bring it back to something that was mentioned at the beginning and sort of come out with a 
sort of speculative political question, which is um, there's a lot of talk about bipartisan consensus around big tech. How deep does that really run? Because from my perspective, it feels like you know th there's there's agreement on the on on the that they don't like big tech, but maybe not much on anything else. And then secondarily to that. There's all these bills floating around from the House Judiciary Committee, and there's also the Senate bills, as one announced last week. There's all sorts of legislation, potential legislation, floating around. Um, how likely is it that that's ever going to land on Biden's desk, the bipartisan agreed bill of any sort applying to any sort of big tech activity? I don't know that we have any legislation, legislative experts up here, but I'll, t I'll, I'll give a couple thoughts on this. I think. Um, Yes, currently big tech is in the in the uh, in the sights of people across the board, right and left. But I agree with with the questioner that it's it may not. There's no deep agreement. I think fundamentally the the the, the concerns of the right and left are quite different. They're in fact opposite. I think the left, the right says that take platforms that that in broad brush. Uh, there's too much censorship going on. There should be more speech allowed on the platforms should let it rip except for clearly criminal behavior, and the left tends to believe that there's too much speech being allowed. So I think they're meeting in their, in their anger at the tech platforms, but for very different reasons, and I think maybe that addresses the second part of yours. I don't, I just, I'd, I'd be surprised if those two, if, if legislators are motivated by those two fundamentally different, different views of what's going on on the platforms could agree on, the, on a common solution. Can I, can I offer a different, yeah. different view? Yeah. Just, I'll just point out that the, the House uh, bills made it through the subcommittee on a bipartisan vote. And I just mentioned Grassley and Klobuchar put out a companion bill, at least on the non-discrimination uh, bill. I can't predict how well it's going to do, but it seems like uh, the fact that it's sponsored uh, by, by folks on both sides of the aisle would increase the probability yeah. of it passing. Yeah. I'll make a, 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 a weak guess, and that is that if any legislation gets to the president's desk, it will be closer to Klobuchar Grassley than to the House bill, because there the Klobuchar bill is, is a, a somewhat, frankly, ham-handed effort to do what I call the recalibration of antitrust within the basic conceptual framework. The House is going much farther departing from, from existing notions of, of antitrust law. I just think that'll be a very hard sell, uh, maybe not in the House, but certainly in the Senate. Okay, sir, over here on the left. Yeah, I, I want to challenge the professors a little bit here. Let's, let's say that we agree that the, the purpose should be to protect consumers. And let's say that we agree that there's a measurement problem. This is very hard, especially when you have a platform. And especially when the platform is charging consumers zero, right? The price is zero. At the same time, I think there's a widely shared sense among consumers right now that the experience of maybe social media in particular has not been an altogether positive one, right? And so what metrics can economists use? If we want to, we can't just throw our hands up in the hair, otherwise somebody's going to take take this away from the economists at some point, right? Is there any way we can be quantitative, right, about the harm to consumers when the prices are, are zero? What other, what other alternatives are there? Uh, I, I'm a little worried about uh, giving up some of the, some of the ideas that I'm, that I'm peddling privately, but there are, there are some, <laughs> there are some methods I hope, I hope that are out there that will, will survive. I would, I would, at a very abstract level, I would just say kind of start on the, on the paying side and then see if you can establish pass through. See if, see if there's an effect that, that's, that's causing the, you know, the, a, a, a transfer or a pass through of these higher prices on the, on the pay side, on the positive price side to the quote unquote zero price side. So just to focus on Apple to be specific, you know, if you could, if you could make the case that um, the higher take rate somehow redounds to the harm of buyers on the app store through the form of higher prices, right? That would be a way of, of uh, connecting the harm to the, to the consumer side. I may be now betraying the fact that I'm at heart a troglodyte, but um, to me, the most serious problems po uh, that consumers face, if, if, I guess consumers is the right word, from the tech platforms 
are uh, addiction and disintermediation. And by disintermediation, I mean we all spend our time on our screens instead of in our churches and in our little league baseball and whatever it might be. I think, the, I think these two phenomena are, are destroying, in the first case, our children, in the second case, our social fabric. Um, so frankly, I'd rather have the government focus on them than, than, than whether Google uh, has too many ads on the top of its search, uh, search responses, but that's just me. Okay, sir, over here on the right. Uh, hi, my name's August. Uh, I'm a 2L law student here. Um, I wanted to ask you two about, uh, or the panel, about um, kind of the, the politics of antitrust today, uh, if that's all right. Um, as I was looking at the bills that were introduced in Congress over the summer, uh, I was reminded about how after the Sherman Act, not that much actual enforcement really happened using that act, and that one of the first areas of enforcement was against a labor union. Um, I'm wondering what you guys think about, should those acts pass, uh, what will happen with the uh, New Open Diocesan movement itself? Will it uh, go away or continue to push for new reforms? And also what will happen to the general economy, if it's even possible to answer that question? Uh, I know that would be a guess at most. Uh, but I'm curious about um, what the consequences of such uh, sweeping bills would be, should they become law. Just make, you said what would happen if the new Brandeis movement went away, or did I mishear you? Oh, I'm sorry. What would happen if those bills passed, and how would the, what, where would the new Brandeisian movement go from there? Can, can I try? Al, yeah. Yeah. And it's also uh, an opportunity to just kind of push back gently on something Doug said about ham-fisted approach in the House. I mean, I don't think that the Cicilline non-discrimination bill is an attempt at all to affect antitrust law. In fact, it's the opposite. It's a recognition that antitrust can't get at these innovation-based harms. And just as you said during your opening remarks, it's going to be a form of regulation or something that's specific competition that's specific to the platforms to protect against self-preferencing and, and the harms associated therein. So um, we have really two flavors of, of laws that are coming down. Oh, you're back, I guess you moved back over there, uh, <laughs> right? We've got this case-by-case uh, -case adjudication, which is, the, which is the preference of a certain type of, of folks, probably myself included, that's the Cicilline bill. Um, or you have the, those who don't believe in case-by-case -case adjudication, just want to jump immediately to structural separation on day one to stop the self-preferencing. So those are the two. Those are those are the two approaches, and we'll see which one of those two kind of went out. Um, I guess as a m minor plug on the case-by-case, -case, the, the the Cicilline bill at least has a provision that would would empower a judge to impose structural separation in the event that she thought that and that a conduct remedy couldn't address the, the self. The self-preferencing, but but uh, the problems that that plague antitrust go way way beyond self-preferencing. Right, self-preferencing is just one problem of many, right? And uh, and I think that there there are no bills in the House right now, at least, that would reform antitrust law. The the closest that we have is that Klobuchar has a has a bill. I don't know if she, she introduces it every every couple of years that would fundamentally alter antitrust, like the standards of antitrust, the presumptions of antitrust. We haven't talked about that yet. But um, that, that to me would, would go after some of, the, some of the problems. I'm not in necessarily endorsing it, but, but I, would, I don't want you to understand the, the House bills to be a mechanism to change antitrust. They're largely going outside of antitrust to go after very specific uh, problems, in particular self-preferencing. Okay, over this microphone on the left. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Ben. I, uh, I actually was one of American Express's lawyers in the Supreme Court, and I, I didn't know this was going to be an Amex panel, unless <laughs> I would have stayed away from the heavy fire. But I actually have a different question, which is, um, I want to pick up on a point that, that Doug, uh, that you made a, a couple times about, you know, the entry barriers issue for, for big tech, and, you know, will they stay high forever and, and, and shield them? And I, you know, just watching the panels today about the crypto and, and Web 3.0 developments and thinking about how you know, those really change the nature of uh, you know, the need for, for intermediaries, maybe not removing it entirely, but a lot of those barriers seem to come from the status of platforms as the trusted intermediary that maybe goes away in a Web 3.0 setting. And, uh, you know, I don't hear a lot about that from enforcers thinking about this, and, you know, we sometimes focus on fighting the battle today, uh, you know, instead of focusing on competition in the future. And I, I just wonder if you were a forward-looking antitrust enforcer right now, thinking about that, what 
what conduct, either from incumbent big tech or from the pioneering Web 3.0 companies, would you be, you know, would you be looking at or, or concerned about if you're thinking about what does this look like five or 10 years from now? I would want to know more about the factual detail than I probably do now, than I probably know now, but conceptually, I wouldn't be trying to play, and this goes, I think I agree with Al about this, but put out a crystal ball and say, what's the future going to look like? You ask what kind of conduct. I would be looking at conduct by firms that seem presently to be dominant, that seems to make it harder for competitors or potential competitors to flourish because that looks like an entry barrier raising conduct. And then I would ask, well, is this serving as some legitimate purpose? Is this a byproduct of a, you know, a welfare enhancing uh, course of conduct uh, or, or something else? So if a platform, whether it's Google or, or, or Amazon or whatever, got into an adjacent business, I would say, well, gee, that, that potentially makes it harder for people to compete against them. But on the other hand, I can think of a million possible efficiencies and benefits from that. So that would be the question I'd be asking. Yeah. Al, anything more? I, I concur. Okay. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think that's right. I, 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 I'm, um, I, the, the whole idea of forecasting the future as a basis for antitrust enforcement, I think, has been a rather unsuccessful exercise historically. Okay, and, and I. I think we've got time for two more. I see one at the mic and one in the back. So maybe both of you over here. So at the mic first. Great. Uh, thank you. My name is Max. I'm a 3L at the law school. Um, so Professors Sykes and Malamed, you guys said that addressing issues like anti uh, misinformation and the broader issues of content moderation aren't antitrust issues. And I kind of I want to ask about whether there should be a distinction in how we think about antitrust in industries of pure commerce, where the consumer welfare model seems to be most justified versus applying it to the information industry, like on social media, for example. Um, the reason that I draw that distinction is that we have this you know, uniquely prized thing that we call the, market, the competitive marketplace of ideas. But the way that things have changed, today the majority of Americans learn about the world through just a handful of platforms, really. And those platforms have First Amendment rights that protect the types of ideas that they're able to either amplify or censor or whatever language we want to use. Um, and doesn't the mere fact that public opinion is channeled through so few filters untenably restrict that prized idea of the competitive marketplace of ideas that we cherish? And I understand that there are other policy measures and levers that we can pull that you guys have talked about, fairness doctrine style things, interoperability. But given the fact that industry consolidation seems to have this unique non-economic effect on, uh, the on the marketplace of ideas, isn't there something to be said for the one lever that we have that does address consolidation? So, well, I, I think um, you, you may disagree, but the consolidation that we see is, for the most part, the product of efficiencies, network externalities, economies of scale and scope, as Doug has mentioned. Um, and you would, if you try to break up these platforms, which is what some people talk about, you would, you would sacrifice great efficiencies and you might find that they just recombine later because of those same efficiencies. So that's why I said in my remarks that I think the right policy instrument is not an antitrust type of remedy, but it is a, um, if you, so I'm not totally persuaded that the flow of information is unduly restricted by the platforms. I mean, you can watch Fox News. You can, you know, there's all these, there's all these other ways to get information besides uh, your Twitter feed or what have you. But if one believes that there is a problem there, it seems to me that some sort of uh, regulation about um, uh, information flow restrictions and censorship would be the, the logical policy instrument. And I think I'll, I'll just kind of stick with that view. I agree with that. By the way, there's an interesting uh, new, new little small paper by a guy named Brian Leiter, who's a University of Chicago professor, on kind of the epistem epistemic challenge to the world posed by uh, the platforms. And kind of basically, he's, he's calling for a revival of the fairness doctrine type of regulation. Um, but let me just throw out a, a, another, um, I'm betraying my generational impairment here. 
People my age sometimes muse, not entirely seriously, but not entirely unseriously either. They say things like, wasn't the world a better place when we all got our news from Walter Cronkite? You know, the silos, uh, the partisanship, the echo chambers, the fact that 30% of the people uh, seem to be unconnected with reality when they talk about the 2020 election. Um, those aren't healthy, so I'm not sure uh, uh, more voices are what we need right now. I'll find you guys afterwards and continue the conversation. <laughs> All right, I think we have one more, if you want to step up to the mic. Uh, thank you so much for the great panel. Um, in, in the it may sound a little bit provocative, uh, especially in these settings, but in the spirit of intellectual uh, humbleness, um, do you follow what's going on in the anti-monopoly cases on the tech companies in China, and do you think that we can learn something from them? Thank you. I'm going to answer the first part of your question, no. I, I don't know about it. Yeah, I, I don't either. China case, no. Yeah. No one interested about how China tries to solve the same problems? OK, thank you. Not, not uninterested, I don't think. But. <laughs> no, no. OK, uh, last, is, is that one more there? What about Europe? I mean, I'm French and German lawyer. Mm -hmm. A lot of things which I've been discussing sounds to me like there was a debate behind Europe four years ago. Now the enforcement is fully fledged in Europe and Germany. And what is the what is your mm -hmm. classic view, if you like to say, from the European enforcement? I can, I can weigh in on this. Yeah, I mean, Europe traditionally has been focused less on harm to consumers, right? And but I think, you more know, my, open my to opinion, other sorts of harm. Yeah, my opinion here is largely influenced by uh, Tomas Phil Philippon's book that, that did a comparison and uh, of the two regimes. And, and to me, the, the most uh, pivotal difference is the, is the presumption and the burdens of proof. And, and so in Europe, you know, they, they will go after you and then, and then um, you know, the burden is on the merging parties or the, or the defendant to, to kind of prove that uh, their conduct is not uh, anti-competitive, whereas here the burden is on the, the, on the government. And, and he thinks that's the big difference. He persuaded me that, that that could have a big effect. And so I do feel like there's a debate going on here. And you know where it comes up is in the vertical merger guidelines, the, the withdrawal and the retraction. There's um, Steve Salop, a, a known antitrust radical, um, has a template for what the replacement should look like. And there's a, there is a, a dominant platform presumption among other presumptions that he's putting forward that would, you know, under certain fact patterns, the burden would automatically begin with the, with the merging parties and not, not, uh, not with the, the enforcers. So that's, a, that's an example of, of us potentially moving in the direction of Europe on these things. So, uh, well, go ahead. I was just going to add on the general um, issue of international antitrust. You mentioned China and Europe. It raises a set of issues that we haven't really talked about, which is uh, parochialism and enforcement. And I think that uh, that has been a real problem historically. Uh, I, I won't go into any great detail, but I think, for example, Europe has gone after American companies to a somewhat excessive extent in certain contexts. And I don't know about China and uh, its relation to U.S. Uh, companies under the Chinese anti-monopoly law. Certainly, I, I saw some evidence that Japan was a little bit aggressive with its anti-monopoly law against a, a company I was working for at one point. So I think, I think antitrust parochialism is a real problem. There are externalities from enforcement. I get the benefits, you bear the costs. And that, uh, that, is, a, that is a whole set of issues that uh, needs to be thought more about, I think, than, than we have. Uh, it pushes in the direction of some sort of global cooperation on competition policy that goes beyond what we have today. Two, just two, let me just add two brief thoughts. Um, uh, our law, as I said at the, in my opening comments, is unique, uh, I think unique, or close to unique at least, in being a, 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 general, a law of general application of decentralized enforcement. So much and important, though, I think it is for international competition laws to be harmonized for lots of reasons, transaction cost and so forth reasons. Um, I do think it's the case that the optimal U.S. antitrust law is going to be a little less pro-plaintiff than the optimal European competition law because there's a very different institutional context. 
On the other hand, one of the institutional attributes in Europe that I think is really quite bad is that for all practical purposes, there's no effective uh, review of facts or law by someone other than the prosecutor until long after the, 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 the order has been issued, the remedy is implemented, and, and so forth. Um, and uh, I, I happen to think that with, uh, with the exception of racial bias, the biggest bias, the most worrisome bias for, for mankind is confirmation bias. And I, don't, I believe this is the case. I've talked to European lawyers about this. Uh, when the European Commission issues this, what's called a statement of objectives, objections, it's a little bit like a preliminary com draft complaint in the United States. They have a hearing after that. They have never failed to rule against the defendant. It's like our Federal Trade Commission, by the way. Same thing. So while conceptually it's appropriate for them to have a more plaintiff-oriented law, substantively, I sure hope they, they and other agencies that use the administrative model uh, get their procedural house in order. We can give a round of applause for our anti-defendant.